Hey, Mike. Yeah, what's going on? Hey, have you ever heard of Turbo Debt? No, what is that? Something to get me into debt faster? No, Turbo Debt is not to get you in debt faster. It's to help you get out of debt. Do you have over $10,000 in credit card, personal loans, medical, or payday loans? Of course I have debt. That's the American way. Oh, contraire, mon frere. Turbo Debt will give you the option to break the debt cycle and start putting money in your pocket. That's awesome. Over 70% of Americans die with credit card debt. Do not let this happen to you. Turbo Debt will give you an option to break the debt cycle and start putting money in your pocket. That's awesome. If you have over 10000 in credit card debt and personal loans, medical or payday loans, they can help. Go to TurboDebt.com forward slash tech time. Again, that's TurboDebt.com forward slash tech time, all capitalized for a free consultation today. TurboDebt is a proud sponsor of this week's episode of Tech Time Radio. Broadcasting across the nation from the East Coast to the West, keeping you up to date on technology while enjoying a little whiskey on the side. With leading edge topics, along with special guests, to navigate technology in a segmented, stylized radio program. The information that will make you go, hmm. Pull up a seat, raise a glass with our hosts as we spend the next hour talking about technology for the common person. Welcome to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. Welcome to Tech Time with Nathan. I'm the show that makes you go, hmm, technology news of the week, the show for the everyday person talking about technology, broadcasting across the nation with insightful segments on subjects weeks ahead of the mainstream media. We welcome our radio audience of 35 million listeners to an hour of insightful technology news. Each week, our show covers the weekly top technology subjects without a political agenda. We verify the facts and we do it with a sense of humor in less than 60 minutes. And of course, with a little whiskey on the side. We are live streaming during our show on five of the most popular platforms, including YouTube, Twitch.tv, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We encourage you to visit us online at TechTimeRadio.com. And you can become a Patreon supporter at Patreon.com forward slash TechTimeRadio. I'm Nathan Mum, your host, a technologist with over 30 years of technology expertise, working for Fortune 500 companies across the country. My co-host here, Mike Roday, is an award-winning author originally from Arizona. Mike's a human behavior expert living in the Seattle area with a master's degree in forensic psychology. Mike is here to keep me from geeking out while providing insightful uh, insights into human behavior and how it interacts with technology. Insightful insights. Insightful insights. We are two friends from different backgrounds, but bringing the best technology show possible every week for our family, friends, and fans to enjoy. Welcome, everyone. Let's start July 4th episode right now now on today's show today on tech time with nathan mum the white house announces 42 billion in expanded broadband services across the u.s to bring high-speed internet to every state and territory we're going to be talking about that the social app irl is shutting down like an 80s comedy movie. And last pass users are furious again. Our guest, Nick Espinosa from Security Fanatics, is joining us for, of course, our 4th of July special. We can't do a holiday show without Why Nick. Why do we always there. do holiday shows with Nick? nothing but cyber crime? Well, you know what? Because Nick is our hero. Well, I know he is, Nick he is, is our, our hero, he but is we, our hero. Always, we always do our... It seems like every holiday is all about all the bad stuff that well, happens. Well, you know what? That's, that causes us to drink on the show. <laughs> That's exactly correct. Mm-hmm. All right. We have our guest, Nick, from Security Fanatics. He's joining us now. I know he's joining us remotely because he's been speaking at a whole bunch of uh, items this upcoming weeks, and I, he's probably, I'm sure, on his 4th of July vacation, but he said he would still join us coming on into our show. So we thank him. And we're going to look back at the Sony Walkman and the success of that. And I have a secret to share with you during the Nathan. Nathan. And I'm not, <laughs> I don't and I'm know not if secrets from you is a good thing. It's a secret. And it's not <laughs> a rant as their last show. Are you sure? Uh, yes. I, I've been, Mark went off it's on me not, in the last show. It's about, not about the health benefits of whiskey. No, it's okay. not about any of that. So it'll be much better. All right. You will not want to miss this special fourth of July. Save your fingers event. All right. Now, in addition, we're looking to have Mike's mesmerizing moment, a technology fail and a possible Nathan Nugget. As always, we have our pick of the day whiskey tasting during the commercial. Let's see if our selected whiskey pick gets zero, one or two thumbs up at the end of the show. And we have Mark back in the studio. He's joining us on the 4th of July. He's going to join us here. And then I think all of us are going to head over to the Mum property. We're going to enjoy a little 4th of July celebration. And we got to be careful with our fingers. That's the only thing I'll say. Don't. 
Don't blow off your fingers. All right, so sit back. Okay, what? Well, we, we we light off fireworks, what, what, right? What's the deal with your fingers, man? Oh, well, okay. So we we we're pretty aggressive with our. Are you, uh, are you planning on something this year? Because no. you know that's that's last year we were safe, right? Uh, that doesn't count. You, but, I mean, you've mentioned your fingers like three or four times, well, so I'm thinking you you got something in store that's bothering. You. Well, we got, maybe we got some high. Uh, it's called explosive. a Floridian slip. By the uh, way. We have some high explosive items that will be at this year's. Uh, okay, uh, Fourth right. of July. Can't wait. All right, now it's time for the latest headlines in the world of technology. Here are our top technology stories of the week. All right. Story number one, White House announces $42 billion to expand broadband across the United States. This is a big story here. This is essentially what Joe Biden said that he was going to do. We talked about this about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And so now he's going to actually get into it. We're going to go to News Nation and Tom Dempsey for more information about what it, this says and what this is about. President Biden will announce billions of dollars in new funding for high-speed internet access. And this will kick off a three-week campaign sending the president and administration officials to 20 states to highlight economic bills that are the cornerstone of his re-election run. Tom Dempsey has more for us from Washington. Hi, Tom. Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, President Joe Biden hopes to pick up some momentum for his re-election campaign by announcing $40 billion to boost high-speed internet access in areas of the country that really need it. Today, we're taking another big step toward internet for all. We're announcing over $40 billion to be distributed to 50 states, Washington, D.C., and territories to deliver high-speed internet in places where there's neither service or it's too slow. And folks, and that includes rural communities like Appalachia. The funding for each state and territory is based on their specific needs. How many of the residents currently lack Internet access and what it will cost to provide that access. With this funding, along with other federal investments, we're going to be able to connect every person in America to reliable high-speed Internet by 2030. The big infrastructure bill passed by Congress months ago included efforts to expand Internet access. Guys. Yeah, Tom, thank you very much. All right. So Internet was once a privilege. You remember back in the day? I mean, we do. Right. I mean, you had to pay for Internet when you had dial up. Right. And so that was kind of paying for Internet. I still pay for Internet. You still pay for Internet. So now you pay for Internet. I do. I pay for I I pay for Internet on on both a a radio area and a home Internet area and for rentals. Yeah. So I I pay a lot of Internet. Comcast Mm -hmm. and and me and the bill system is pretty big taken care of. Um, How do you feel about Internet now becoming a privilege for all Americans? It's becoming a privilege. It already well, was a privilege. Well, I, now with necessity. this bill, this bill essentially is allowing everybody you know, to have high speed. Okay, so the tech nerd in me says that's awesome that it's now a necessity. Okay. But the human person is like, that's unfortunate that it has to become a necessity. Okay. Okay, that's fair. That's so, fair. But, you know, now are we going to have utility companies that, that are taking over the Internet? Is that how that's going to well, work? Well, the funding has been that's promised. Really sucky. Yeah, so it's been promised at $1.2 trillion for the Infrastructure Act that would be allocated to state and territories. This is really kind of a big thing, too, uh, I noticed. So this is part of the infrastructure. This is part of the infrastructure out of the $1.2 trillion that were already passed. So this is a subset of within that money that's been allocated. Uh, interesting that it's states and territories, because I, I don't know if any time I've ever seen so many uh, disclaimers that saying that it's going to territories also. So normally it's just the United States. You kind of leave that in there as a part of the Biden's administration goal to connect everyone in the U.S. to reliable, affordable, high speed Internet. By the end of the decade, the broadband equity access and deployment known as the BED, B-E-A-D, BED program or BEAD, sorry, the BEAD program will allocate the four point two billion dollars in different amounts to each state territories in Washington, D.C. At a minimum, territories will get $27 million and states $107 million, up to a maximum of $3.3 billion. Put simply, high-speed internet is necessary in today's society for remote health care for all Americans. So Joe Biden kind of yeah. went off on this, saying that since we have remote health care that's been available, really kind of at its forefront during COVID, right? Mm-hmm. So it came on up there, that this should be available for everybody to be able to have a live meeting and stream with a teledoctor to be able to get their health needed wherever they're at in the United States. The funding connects homes and businesses comes from the $1.2 trillion infrastructure act signed last November. 
The BEAD program represents $4.2 billion promised at a signing of deployment broadband in areas with high-speed internet. In areas where broadband is already available and additional uh, items, the high-speed internet is affordable now for low-income people at a payment rate of $30 a month. So essentially, if you're in low-income areas, you'll be able to receive high-speed internet for $30 a month. Now, does that... In so in this plan, does that really allow people to have it at the $30 a month or are you going to need to subsidize it even more for people to get high speed internet? I don't know. I actually I think, know. I actually I, I think, think the $30 gonna, a month I have a gonna, problem with. I think, well, there are programs that allow people to get internet services for $10 a month. So, so $30 know, is a little so bit more expensive. If it's, if it's government, if it's high speed internet. Okay. The internet that is available now is not high speed internet. Okay. And so, you know, we're we're probably going to see a an increase in every other internet too. So, uh, you know, So high gonna, speed is going to be low speed. High speed is going to be low speed and and the people who are paying more money for internet are going to demand higher speeds and and we already know that it exists already out there. So, the cable companies and internet companies are going to jump on that and start charging premium prices for higher speed internet. Well, what's interesting is that $2.75 billion are essentially being redlined to keep ISPs servicing low income areas for fast internet. So essentially ISPs, these ISP companies don't service uh, large populated areas. Now they don't go on in and take care of the service. Essentially they become at the end of a waiting list right now. So they have to allocate money to enable the ISPs to get out there and ensure that people can get fast internet. It's also interesting that $2 billion go for indigenous governments and the organization of $2 billion in grants and loan to build internet infrastructure in rural areas. So I, I, I'm excited about this. I, I do think Joe Biden has been probably the most proactive president we've ever had regarding internet, internet security, different aspects that we have. All the rest of the presidents is kind it, of... Is this really, is this really the joe biden administration or is it just because the joe biden administration happened right after a, a global pandemic that has forced us to read well this is what he ran on right so this is like his political platform was this. well i know so he that, said that he'd give everybody yeah. internet access so i guess he at least came through yeah, on he, it you know some other president promised to build a wall and that they were quite caught i don't I, I don't really know that that's a proactive statement though okay okay that's fair that's fair all right well i am interested to see how this plays out i hope that the money just doesn't go to these large isp companies already I, and then they just I, don't suck gonna, it in they're gonna, and they're gonna they're find give... ways of capitalizing on it I mean, we all know that I, I hope not i hope that everybody does get the access to the internet I, I don't know if they all need to be streaming netflix necessarily as a american right but i guess what speed inter- well i don't <laughs> are I, you serious I, yeah did, I don't, I, I, did you just say that i don't think everybody needs to be streaming media stuff as a, as a right but i do want them to oh, have okay. high speed access so, but if they <laughs> are you what I just don't get. I don't I, like so so, your, your 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 stance here is that yes, they should have high speed internet, but they shouldn't have a high enough speed that they can stream it. Well, I just don't think we should Netflix. Be, well, I don't know. Is Netflix like a? Is that something that you pay for? And is that a special? That's a service. Is, is right? a special so, privilege to to get that? You pay for that. Any, everything that we do here in America is a privilege. Which is interesting. Is I went down to we my don't local have library. Anything that's not a privilege. It's a privilege to buy food. That's true. That's true. I went down to my local uh, library. Just a couple of weeks back, and I I did a DSL speed test just to see the speed that it was. Uh, and it was a gig internet that was available in the local library, and there's nobody on these computers at all. I was like, what What the heck? I mean, that you could literally have gamers come and crash in the public library system and literally get probably better they probably speeds did. than they're, they're doing at home. Okay, all right, all right. Well, Mike, I think you have story number two. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pull back from the Earth globe here and talk okay. about space stuff. Oh, we like space stuff. Astronomers have discovered an asteroid that orb- that orbits the sun with Earth, earning it the moniker a quasi-moon. Recently discovered asteroid 2023 FW13 has created a bit of a stir among asteroid watchers. It turns out to be on an orbit that is not only in a one-to-one resonance with the Earth, but follows a path that actually circles it, albeit on an orbit that is so eccentric that it sweeps out halfway to Mars and halfway into Venus. Okay, so explain that to me. So I guess it, so it's so we're on like one side of the sun, and it's a, on the exact same opposite side of the sun. 
I don't know. That's a, that's a, I, I believe that's what they're I saying. I think that's what it is, but it... it uh, so is that like a multiverse? No, no. This Are is, you sure? Yeah. yeah. Because that could this, be like another Earth that's just have different you know, you're, time? You're, you're, this, is, this is an asteroid. This is okay. not an Earth body. Oh, okay, okay. 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 This is Thanks. not an Earth-sized planetoid that's floating around out there with your uh, Marvel, right. Marvel Star Trek guys <laughs> on it. Okay. All right. Okay. There's no formal definition for objects like this which are sometimes called quasi moons or quasi satellites. Okay, that means they're they're large enough to qualify as something but not big enough to be considered a full moon. Okay? Which is like our moon. I get you. Okay. They follow a path around the earth, but usually no more than a few decades. Uh perhaps the best known of these objects known as 469219 Kamo Owalo Wea. Oh, I, I I don't know if that's correct. Okay, I'm sure it was found in 2016. And is considered the smallest, closest, and most stable known quasi satellites. It has an orbit that has been in a stable resonance with Earth for almost a century and will remain so for centuries to come. Okay, this asteroid was first observed on March 28th by the Pan Stars Observatory atop a mountain in Maui. After further observations from the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope on Moana Kea and from observatories on Kitt Peak and Mount Lemmon in Arizona, the discovery was officially announced on April 1st. When I saw the announcement, the very Earth-like semi-major axis looked suspicious to me, says Adrian Coffinet, a French astronomer. I'm pretty sure I said his name wrong. Okay. Coffinet was the first to identify the nature of the quasi-moon's orbit after running its orbital parameters through a simulator that extrapolates into the past and future. The asteroid is actually orbiting the sun and is not gravitationally bound to Earth. However, it's in resonance with our planet, which is why the path loops widely around Earth. So it, it sort of mimics the Earth's rotation around the sun. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, that's great. All right, story number three. Yeah, let's talk about that. All right, social app IRL is shutting down, and this story is written like an 80s comedy movie. Now, the only thing I think of is Opportunity Knocks. Have you ever seen that with Dana Carvey? Uh, that's that's really old. That's an 80s movie. So this is an 80s movie. This is the same exact story. So essentially, Dana Carvey plays a, uh, a con artist, and he breaks into this place. And so Opportunity Knocks, great 80s movie. All 80s That's type of deal. Really old. There's a love story in there. Okay. And it, okay. Now, essentially, it's, it's we so got it. information. This is so <laughs> funny. You're going to love this. We got information from our Tech Time reporter, Jason Twill. We're going to go to it right now and listen a little bit about the IRL social media app. CEO of messaging app IRL repeatedly said it had 20 million monthly active users who chatted about shared interests. A spokesperson for the startup said an investigation by the board of directors concluded 95% of those users were automated or from bots. As a result of the probe, the spokesperson said the company would shut down and return capital to shareholders two months after it suspended the founder and CEO, Abraham Shafi, for alleged misconduct coming under scrutiny in a series of articles in the information which questioned its user number claims. All right, so let me just say, Abraham Shafi. Mm-hmm. His, his nickname should be Mr. Shafty. That's what I'm just going to call him. Are you, <laughs> Mr. Shafty. Well, you're on it today. Yeah, this is what we got. Okay, so the social media app, IRL, it's is known in real life. Yeah, it's known as in real life. is shutting down after discovering something was off about its 20 million users. An international investigation by the company's board of directors found that more than 95% of the accounts on the six-year-old company were automated or from bots. Um, again, okay, you have 20 million users, 20 million bots, 95% of your, of your users are fake. The, the app now targeted Gen Z for all about real life experiences. And IRL said younger users were flooding to its app, but it was mostly make believe the app started off as a tool to discover real world events. The COVID-19 pandemic couldn't have run into the ground it more, but instead IRL quickly pivoted to prioritize the discovery of online events like live stream concerts, esports events, Zoom parties, and more. A message posted on the company's website confirmed the app would stop working on January 27th. In a brief timeline of IRL's unraveling, in 2017, IRL was launched by Abraham Shafty and an early PayPal board member, Scott Bannister. 
In June of 2021, IRL's valuation passes the one billion mark. This company was worth one billion dollars, pushing it to be coveted unicorn club with over 107 million dollars in a Series C funding round led by Japanese investing giant SoftBank's Vision Fund Two. It claims to have over 12 million users a part of that funding group. IRL makes its first acquisition in December of 2021. It actually purchases a digital startup company called AEBEZE Labs, where we have tech tools to promote healthier social media practices. In May of 2022, employees begin to express doubt about the 20 million user figure. In June of 2022, the social app cuts 25% of its staff. But Shafty, in a company-wide memo, says that the IRL has more than enough cash to last <laughs> well into 2024. All right, December 20, 2022, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission opens an investigation into IRL, probing its misled investors. A special committee of the IRL's board of directors suspended Shafty, or Shafty, for his partners of misconduct and have him step down from the board. In 2023, IRL employees are notified about the impending shutdown as the company was a fake. Okay. All right. So, so this is, this has the Ashley Madison thing going on. They, they've got all these fake bots, fake bots talking on it. Yep. And saying stuff in real life. 95% of this, 95% company. of this company is but this guy got a billion dollar evaluation for his company. How the heck can you pull? Uh, that is like a high, that's like highway crime. Sure. It Forget is. con artists. Why do, why I don't even know why you even act surprised that this even happens. Somebody has to do a due diligence on this. Come on. There's, if somebody says there, they have there these are people so do many research. people doing so many things you can't do dil, do dil, blah, 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 due diligence on everything. Okay. That's how these things fall through the cracks. Okay. And it's so easy to fool everybody. Look, I mean, look how easy that that this has been going on for 6 years. I know. The Japanese mob will take care of them. So, <laughs> there you go. Well, that ends our top technology stories of the week. Moving on, we have a major disruption going on in our cyber attacks. We're going to explore this in our next segment. Ask the expert with Nick Espinosa from Security Fanatics. Nick is back by popular demand. And like always, he's on a holiday show. We'll be back after these commercial breaks. Hello, listeners. We're excited here at Tech Time Radio, aren't we, Mike? Oh, no. We have an announcement to make starting in June. We're really excited to be a part of an internet radio station. That's right. Coming up in June, you will still be able to listen to us live here at Kixie 880 and KKNW and all of our affiliate stations. But you'll be able to listen to us at 8 a.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday now. We look forward to this new opportunity to provide you Tech Time Radio every weekday. And again, you can always catch us online at techtimeradio.com. Welcome back to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Tech Time is a weekly technology show that talks about current technology in a simple format without having to geek out. Brought to you by myself, Nathan Mum, and Mike Reday. We just had our first whiskey tasting. We have Mark Gregoire in the studios today, and he's going to be telling us about what we are sipping in our pick of the day. Today on the show, Mark, what have we chosen? Well, before we get to that, Nathan, I would like to say I love your Fourth of July hat. Oh well, thank you very much. Someone else and so it, we went and through the a lights whole... up and everything. I know. Why, why are it... you kissing his butt? Well, well I just... wanted to know if it was too tight on his head because he's getting some facts wrong again. Oh, oh. no! Well, what fact did I get wrong? Well, no. Opportunity Knox was <laughs> yeah. released March thirtieth, nineteen ninety. Oh, it's not an 80s movie. No, it is not. Technically, oh. it's not. Okay. Okay. I guess. Okay. Have I think you seen I'm in the studio? Again. Have you seen that movie? I have not. Okay, well, until you you got to see it. It's a comedy love story. Dana Carvey is hilarious. Yeah, I, I remember when All it right. came out. That's one that it's like one on Rotten Tomatoes. No, we, no, no, we, no, no, no. We no. we know that it's not the hat because he does this all the time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. all right. Well, we are sipping on <laughs> to get rid of it. That's not gonna help. You, you made me feel bad. I'm gonna not That's take. Not gonna hat. help. That's right. Yeah. Oh, put it back on. Uh, wow. <laughs> All right. Just tell us what we're tasting about here. Mark, what are we tasting? This week on the 4th of July, we're yes. drinking Willet Pot Still Reserve Bourbon. It's from the Willet Distillery in Bardstown, Kentucky, straight bourbon. We don't know the age. We don't know the mash bill, but we do know it's only 94 proof. So I brought Ooh. you a low proof one since there'll be lots of drinking later today. That's right. At the party afterwards. And $60 for this bottle. And I do have a little bit more to talk about that price again this week as I did last week. Okay. But we'll save that for the mumbles. 
Uh, the tasting notes this week are Curtis, uh, courtesy of Bill Thomas. He's from Jack Rose Dining Saloon. Okay. And he says about this, nose is vanilla lemon cake. The palate is a balance of caramel, vanilla, spices, and citrus. I'm not sure if they made the opulent bottle to match the whiskey or vice versa. This was a weird bottle. When it poured, it sounded... Uh, it, it you heard the, the glug, glug, glug. Yeah, glug, glug. it did that. It's I Dream of Genie yeah. whiskey. I will tell you... Oh, that's a good one. There you go. I'll tell you all about the bottle during the mumbles. Okay, great. All right. All well, right. Well, thank you, So gentlemen. far, I, I'm liking the whiskey. Have What do you think of it? Uh, I'm liking it so far. Okay, yeah, a little bit more mellow, a little bit less punch, a little bit more subtle this week than last week. It is. All right. Well, our first whiskey right. tasting is complete. Now let's move on to our feature segment with our technology expert, Nick Espinosa, joining the show. I'm sure for his 4th of July weekend, he is enjoying it with his family. He's probably remote, but we are excited to have our cybersecurity and network infrastructure expert, Nick, on. Now, Nick is an expert regarding Fortune 100 level companies regarding cybersecurity. At the age of 19, he founded Windy City Networks, later acquired in 2015, and he has then created Security Fanatics, where he's the chief security fanatic. Let's welcome Nick to our video stream segment and start this episode. Welcome to the segment we call Ask the Experts. With our Tech Time Radio expert, Nick Espinoza. Wow, Nick. Thank Hi, you Nick. for joining us on, on our 4th of July event. You know, it's always a great time having you. Anytime we do a holiday event, it's a Nick Espinoza show. There you go. There you go. And, you know, it's funny. I actually did uh, like a video podcast a few days ago on IRL, and I could not decide if they were Ashley Madison, where you had like 300 million horny guys talking to six women and two million bots, or <laughs> if, they were, if they were Theranos, basically fake it till you make it until it all implodes on you like a dying star. So I wasn't sure which it was, but either way, oh, my God. Again, how do these companies get a billion plus and, and just totally, totally rip everybody off? I don't get that at all. So let me just tell you, the guy's name, poor Shafi. That was his name. Dude, so so when you're doing your presentation. You just made off to everybody. Dude, do you, you, don't you think, I mean, isn't there any type of rhyme or reason that you're like, maybe this is not uh, what it seems to be taken care of? I don't, well, I, I don't know. I cannot know. believe how they get we money. As human, we as humans are easily distractible. This happens a lot more than we want it to. It's just part of life. A billion dollars yeah. though, invested yeah. in fake bots, man. I, I you know what? Crazy. I'm going to create. A, I'm going to create something new, and I'll just. Uh, and then what happens to him? So, Why he, are so you the board, yourself. Well, the board removes him. He probably spent the money like a sieve, right? He probably was party here, party there, and everything. Yeah. And then what, what's his? What's the repercussions? Oops, sorry guys, I didn't have as many bots. Uh, the SEC, the, S yeah, the, the SEC will make sure he's in SEC jail, whatever that means. Yes. <laughs> or like, in other words, they can they can prevent him from like forming another company or sitting on a board. That you makes know, sense. So, yeah. yeah, so that's probably what's going to happen here. But yeah, a lot of people lost their shirts. But if you look at like Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, and you see those interviews, I mean, she's on it. You would never know unless you knew, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Anyway. All right, Nick. So explain to us here. We got some information going on with 4,500, 40, 45,000 students from Move It, the transfer server. Uh, the New York Police Department of Education was brought in, and essentially what? it says the hackers stole. The New York City Department of Education okay. and Police, both okay. of them were brought in, and essentially the hackers stole documents containing sensitive information and documents internally and externally from various vendors, including special education services providers. This is a big deal in the cybersecurity oh, yeah. news right now. Explain why this is so important and what happened on the Move It transfer server. Yeah, yeah. So happy Fourth of July, everybody. Yep. <laughs> Here I am, Debbie Downer. Um, so I don't yeah, know. all of our holiday episodes are Debbie Downer episodes. Yeah. No, they're not. They're just <laughs> very educational. They are, they are whiskey heavy episodes there you go. every yeah. time. Yeah. Right, like, like I say, like I say, I'm fun at parties. Just don't ask me about my job. But here we go. So, uh, yeah. So move it. Literally, that's how you spell it. Move it. Uh, one word uh, was essentially a file transfer product uh, run by an outfit called Ipswich, which is owned by a company called progress and essentially every it person on the planet was using this apparently in their business to move large chunks of data everywhere else the new york city school system was no different and so the department of education essentially was moving large amounts of data using this platform move it 
to various vendors and various service providers for you know whatever they were servicing the New York public school system for. And by virtue of that, this massive critical vulnerability propped up in there that made essentially it easy enough for me to teach a third grade class how to break in to move its systems and therefore you could steal data and do other things and that's exactly what happened. And unfortunately, uh, as we are looking at all of the breaches that have happened thus far, the New York school system, while it is critical because obviously there's children involved in this, is actually from a record size pretty small compared to the others, which is insane because we're talking about tens of thousands of records here as well. So there you go. All right, so how many total documents were accessed without authorization? What, what, what's the number we're looking at with this breach? Right, so it, it, basically the estimate is that there are a total of 45,000 documents were caught up in this, but roughly 19,000 or so were actually accessed uh, you know, by people that were not authorized to see this information. We're talking about things like social security numbers, employee ID numbers, all that kind of stuff, and approximately 9,000 social security numbers out of that 19,000. Uh, obviously, the, the, you know, all of the law enforcement got brought in. Uh, you know, New York City has its own cybercrime task force, the FBI. I mean, you name the alphabet soup, they're all looking at this one uh, for obvious reasons because it's a government entity. But, but yeah, so we're looking at about 19,000 uh, different documents in total uh, that were probably accessed uh, potentially by threat actors due to this huge vulnerability. All right. So there's a lot of breaches that are happening. Is this a specific ransomware gang that did this breach or or is this a known group? Because we used to have Revil, right? Revil was kind of the leader and they 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 were the big boys on the block. Is this the same type of group or is there a new group? rising to power in these cybersecurity breaches. Yeah, well, so the one that's taking a lot of responsibility for a lot of these breaches, although they are, for the record, not the only ones doing this, is the Klopp ransomware gang. They've been around for a while now. Um, there are newer gangs out there on the market, like Play, for example, um, you know, Black Cat, et cetera, et cetera. But Klopp is essentially, for lack of a better term, a very polished organization. Um, and, and so by virtue of that, they have been taking responsibilities and they basically went on a spree hitting a ton of companies out there that had move it, copying out data, holding them for ransom, et cetera, et cetera. So Klopp out of Eastern Europe, we suspect Russia is essentially behind this and, and they're trying to make a lot of money on everybody using this product. All right. So, so when did this data go public? Essentially, we had the data theft uh, come in, in June and essentially Klopp's dark website posted this data. Mm-hmm. How, how did the data get posted? What the data is available for purchase? Does this uh, victims disclosed by the breach? Are they posted out there with names from Move It? That, what happened to this data on the dark web that's available for purchase? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, Klopp, the way they work is, and it's like most ransomware gangs, they have a leak site in the dark web. I actually went to their website in the dark web, and um, they have specific notices for specific organizations that have been hit as a result of Klopp, as a result of MoveIt, uh, you know, for the record, basically saying, okay, here's here's the timeline for you to essentially pay us to not put out any of this data. And that's essentially their goal. So in other words, if you're one of their victims, uh, they're basically saying, hey, you've got a week or two to uh, essentially pay us and we will not expose your data to the rest of the world. Otherwise, we'll either sell it or we'll dump it out there. And so the clock has been ticking on something like over 100 companies around the world right now, a good chunk of those sitting under, um, you know, the clock you know, the cloud name. And some of these companies are absolutely like well known around the globe. So it's kind of nuts, you know, what we're seeing right now on their website. Deep All right. So let's, so let's talk about the deletion of electronic records, right? So this was an interesting story that hit the, the wire. We essentially have uh, JP Morgan to pay SEC fines. The SEC has fined JP Morgan Chase and company 4 million in, de- in essentially an allegation of deleting 47 million electronic records. Now, this mm-hmm. is that's a, that, that's a huge <laughs> amount of records that were deleted. Explain a little bit what happened with J.P. Morgan Chase regarding this fine. Well, the interesting part about this one is I think everybody's going to be putting on their conspiracy theory tinfoil hats as to why one of the largest banks in the entire world mysteriously lost a whole bunch of email. But here's essentially officially what they told the SEC. JP Morgan is basically saying that those 47 million emails belong to the retail banking group. And those were mistakenly but permanently deleted, which is actually a surprise to me. Now, those emails were basically uh, for about four months or so, through about four or five months of 2018, and 
they were deleted apparently in June of 2019. So this has just come into late uh, to light out of about 8,700 mailboxes for their employees. And that basically uh, includes about 7,500 employees or so that actually work with customers directly. Meaning if I'm using JP Morgan for all my banking needs or whatever, I'm emailing, let's say my rep there back and forth back in 2018 from January through April, those deal, those are basically gone. And now this deletion, interestingly enough, occurred after JP Morgan, and this is what they're blaming. They're basically saying their compliance technology department had been trying to get rid of these documents um, and delete communications that were no longer needed to be legally held for compliance from like the 1970s and 1980s. And so they brought in a third party outside vendor. And according to the cease and desist order from the SEC, the vendor apparently failed to properly apply policies to a retention and essentially just wiped them out, gone, adios. And that obviously is a huge problem. The reason why the SEC has retention policies, usually like three years plus, um, most stuff is seven years, is because they're looking for malfeasance, uh, mal like basically like patterns of malfeasance through the data. In other words, like if you're ripping off JP Morgan because you know, you're know you a person there that can do that, an employee, you're gonna see over time like patterns of shifting money and all that kind of stuff, communications, and so that's why we have legal holds on this. If somebody you know, is suspected of, of ripping off JP Morgan, this is exactly the evidence and data that the regulators are going to want to tip through. And now it's gone. So there you go. Well, this, uh, this has to be, of course, the first time JP Morgan has failed to retain essential business communications, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. They have a sterling record of paying literally massive fines for this exact thing over <laughs> the years. A, I mean, that's a stunning question. No kidding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's rewind about a year and a half. And in late 2021, the SEC announced that J.P. Morgan had agreed to pay $125 million to settle claims of what they say, and I quote, widespread and longstanding failures by the firm and its employees to maintain and preserve written communications, end quote, over just multiple, multiple years. And on the exact same day, their Commodity Futures and Trading Commission, that is the federal government, basically levied another $75 billion fine against J.P. Morgan Security securities, along with two other J.P. Morgan Chase entities, for basically doing the same damn thing. And essentially what we ended up with that single day was $200 million of fines for this. So that $4 million, I'm pretty sure their CEO will root around, you know, his couch cushions and just change and pay that. But yes, they, there is a history here, not to mention a massive breach that cost them $75 million back in like 2014, 2015, and all of this kind of stuff. And to be fair, when you've got a huge company with this many employees, there's a lot of moving parts. But this is why we have compliance law. Everybody's got to get trained and everybody's liable. And here we are. And they were all using in real life to talk to each other. Yeah, do, you, do, you, do you bank you with, do you, no, bank with I Chase? No, I, you know what? That's very horrible is that I do have a Chase account. I not only have one, but I have two accounts that does for, for this you bank go. that just gets Well, given, given the way this economy is going, most of my investments are now canned goods and shotguns, so you can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last thing we want to get into here. Well, you got a question, Mark? Well, no. What's that? In shock, whiskey, buddy, whiskey, whiskey. Oh, okay. okay there you go. Oh, Come everybody on. needs whiskey. All right. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about the Russian coup a couple weeks ago, right? So, yeah. Uh, as we're sitting back enjoying our Fourth of July, what what happened on the cyber front? regarding the Russian coup? Yeah, so this one, I mean, just, you know, just as somebody that's in, been involved somewhat in this conflict has been absolutely insane and wild to watch. I mean, literally that weekend, the world was on edge as the Wagner Group's leader, um, Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin, basically just started marching his troops and said, you know what, we're done. And uh, the Russians, you know, the Russian military missile strike the, the Wagner bases. And so he marched all the way to about 200 uh, kilometers within Moscow. Everybody thinking this guy's about to overthrow Putin. Now, and here we are. And so while he was tearing up the Russian countryside, the Russian military and their government was actually scrambling to change the narrative and also get ready for a possible siege. We saw a whole bunch of citizen journalists basically giving us videos of sandbags and machine guns going all over Moscow, heavy armor, etc. But interestingly enough, we heard initial reports that Prigozhin had actually hacked into Russian state television to deliver his message of rebellion or coup or whatever you want to call it, although he didn't call it a coup. And we were getting reports for hours that Russian disinformation units were spinning 
absolute ton of just fake news and disinformation all across the region, you know, in, in an attempt to basically slow this down and confuse people and ensure the people that the Russian government was in charge, which quite frankly, we're not sure they were. So things like, you know, uh, Prigozhin was assassinated or Wagner troops were giving up or even the Chechens were going to come on in and, you know, and all this into the fray. And depending on who you were listening to, the Chechens were supporting Putin or they were supporting Prigozhin. We heard that Belarusian uh, President Alexander Lukashenko fled the country on his airplane and suddenly he's back in Belarus brokering a deal. And so, so you know, it, it was absolutely nuts and it was absolutely fascinating just to watch. It was total chaos, but it was really telling, you know, just how fast they were trying to squash, you know, all of this news that was leaking out left and right that literally Russian, the Russian government may simply fall due to, you know, a, like 10,000 essentially mercenaries in their country. And on top of it, what's interesting too is that Prigozhin actually was the one that ran the Internet Research Agency, if you remember them from the 2016 election, spinning disinformation, which he publicly admitted last year in 2022 at a conference. Yeah, we totally meddled with the elections and we'll do it again. So this guy is a master at disinformation, you know, and just simply went off the grid, brokered a deal, and I still, to this day, can't figure out exactly what his end game was, but apparently it wasn't toppling the government, and here we are. It was just a wild, wild, interesting time from a disinformation warfare standpoint. This sounds like a movie. It's, you know what? This oh, yeah. is going to be a movie. This I'm is going to sure. be a movie. Like, it's going to be Tom like Clancy. Netflix will do it. Netflix this is Tom Clancy. It That's Tom Clancy stuff. Yeah. This is really, this is, this is Tom Clancy. <laughs> it really All is. Right. Well, Nate. Thank you so much for being a part of our 4th of July you're, show. You're I said, Nick. No, Nick. you said Nate. I said, Nate. All right, Nick. You know, I've been, either, I've been called worse either way. So, okay. <laughs> Nick, we want to thank you for being a part of our 4th of July show. How can people get in touch with you and listen to your weekly updates? Uh, yeah, you can uh, like, share, follow me at Nick AESP on Facebook and Twitter. You can subscribe to me at YouTube at Nick Espinoza. And I, like I said, daily podcast, daily videos, and just come hang out and we'll riff. All good funny tech commercials. I, I don't understand a lot of commercials and, and advertising funniness in tech, but Nick posts probably the best stuff on Twitter. So make sure you subscribe to his Twitter feed so you can get his little uh, pictures that he talks about tech stuff. All right. Thank you so much Thanks, Nick. for being a part of our show on our 4th of July episode, Nick. Take it easy, guys. Happy 4th. All right. Bye-bye. That ends our segment, Ask the Expert with Nick Espinoza. Up next, we have This Week in Technology. So now would be a great time to enjoy a little whiskey on the side as we are going to be doing so during the break. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. See you in a few minutes. This is Mark and Greg for Copiers Northwest with a terrific offer called Printer Care Plus. It's simple. Buy HP printer cartridges from Copiers Northwest. It will service your current printers for free. That sounds too good to be true. Sounds like a love-love relationship for IT departments. Don't get too carried away. So how do they get more details on Printer Care Plus? Call Copiers Northwest today, 206-282-1200 or visit copiersnw.com. Copiers Northwest, new ideas, new solutions. And now, let's look back at this week in technology. All right, looking back into this week in technology, we got July 1st, 1979, the first Sony Walkman, the TPS L2, goes on sale in Japan. We go on sale in the U.S. about a year later, but allowing owners to carry their personal music with them was a hit. The Walkman and its iconic headphones introduced a revolution of listening habits and popular culture at large. The metal-cased blue and silver Walkman, the world's first low-cost personal stereo, was sold for around... 3,000, 30, 33,000 30, yen, yen or $150. Uh, Sony predicted it would sell about 5,000 units a month. It sold more than 30,000 in the first two months, and over 100 million Walkmans have been sold before the invention of the portable CD players. Used in countless 80s movies, maybe 90s too, includes one of our favorites, Back to the Future, in the 2014 opening scene of Guardians of the Galaxy. That was This Week in Technology. If you ever wanted to watch some Tech Time history with over two years of video, podcasts, and blog information, you can visit Tech Time Radio to watch our older shows or join the Tech Timers Facebook group to talk with us live all the time. We're going to take a commercial break here. When we return, we have our Mark's Mumble Whiskey Review with Mr. Greg Wine in studio and our Technology Fail of the Week. See you after the break.
Hello, my name is Arthur, and my life's work is connecting people with coffee. Story Coffee is a small batch specialty coffee company that uses technology to connect people to each product resource, which allows farmers to unlock their economic freedom. Try our medium roast founder series coffee, which is an exotic bourbon variety that is smooth, fresh, and elegant at storycoffee.com. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. Today, you can get your first bag free when you subscribe at storycoffee.com with code TECHTIME. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. The segment we've been waiting all week for, Mark's Whiskey Mumble. You like that music, don't you? I, I, I was hoping there's some fireworks were going to go off. Oh, okay. Oh, that, okay. But, but you were doing the sound effects for the fireworks. Yes, I was okay. trying. Congratulations. <laughs> it sounded like you were coughing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, what are we celebrating today? Uh, alcohol. Could in, it be uh, Independence Day? Oh, the Independence that's, Day. That's, that's right. too obvious. Oh, okay. Oh, what day is it then? Well, besides the famous Mum Family Fourth of July party, you all mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. After the show. All right. All right. It's National Hillbilly Day. What the heck? This okay, day, I'm speechless. This day recognizes hillbilly culture and celebrates the tradition and lifestyles of those that reside in rural areas of the southern United States. Oh, now we'll be able to get internet, though. Yeah. <laughs> Hillbillies really? have Seriously? a reputation for yeah. living a very different life than those who live in urban and suburban areas. Yes, they do. Okay. Now, I personally am not celebrating that type of hillbilly day. I am celebrating the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, okay. I love that show. Well, that was a good show. It was a good show. It was. The original or the reboot? The original. The reboot wasn't that bad either. It I had, had not seen the reboot. Oh, really? It no, had the, the guy that it. was like, uh, oh, Vern, whatever his name was. That, that the guy, He was pretty funny. I forget his name now. Yeah, move on. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so to celebrate National Hillbilly Day, we have a whiskey from Kentucky. Okay. So will it pot still reserve? Reputation stems primarily from its attention-grabbing bottle design. It's a unique glass decanter reminiscent of a copper pot still. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the bourbon is believed to originate from a column still, okay. which is the most popular type used to make bourbon, not in a pot still. Though Scotland and Ireland sometimes still use a pot still, American distillers have moved to the column still for reasons of volume and profits, of course. All right. Well, well now, now, hang on. I got to help right, you. Right. For your hillbillies, right. it was Jim Varney. Is who I was talking about, and he was also an Ernest goes to camp. Ernest oh, saves Christmas. So I just want to yeah. make sure he I, was in Toy Ernest. Story too. Uh, he was at a Slinky the dog. You're correct. Yep. yep. Okay. I just want to make sure I I had my you got Billy it. correct. Okay. Um, well, I thank you for fact checking. Okay. So no. we don't have to run that scroll at the end of the show with okay. all the corrections. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, you should have some more whiskey. All right, that sounds great. Thank you. So just like last week, my thumbs up or down come down to price. So for this week, in this bottle, I paid sixty dollars when I bought it. But, okay. Now since then, for that it's a thumbs up. Okay. Now since then, the current price has gone up in our local chain liquor store that also sells wine. Yeah, wine some more. It's currently ninety five dollars. What? Is that yeah. too much for a thumbs up? I would pass on that. So many. Many reviewers of whiskey exclude price, kind of like this thumbs up, thumbs down show. Is I, 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 I think I think price is important, though. But I do too, and I th I'm not one of We're those. We're here people. to talk about taste, though. We I don't have, talk about price here. I have limited funds, so yeah. the final choice of whether it gets to my shelf space on my bar, I have to put price as a factor. Okay, that's, that makes sense. I, I think so, that's very fair. So for the sixty bucks, 60 uh, it's bucks a beautiful is bottle. I, I it's been on my shelf for about a year. I love it. 90 but for, bucks. But coming up to 100, that's before tax. So that'd be about 120 here in Washington. Yeah. That's too much for a 94 proof unaged stated bourbon. I agree with you. I, that's a, maybe the first time I've agreed with Mark on his uh, mumble. You're just kissing. You've me. had a lot of whiskey. So thank you. Finally, the, the brain, maybe is that maybe that is true. Maybe you do think See, better. Yeah, that's exactly last right. Week. Yeah. All right. Okay. No, whiskey and the technology. health benefits of whiskey yeah. has affected you correctly. That's right. You know, it's a great pairing. Just like the pairing of Sonny and Cher. Oh, no. Right, Mike? Can you stop? That ended in divorce. Well, hang on. <laughs> but they had some great songs that were phenomenal when they were together. I got you, babe. That's right. That's exactly right. Now let's get ready for our technology fail of the week. Brought to you by Elite Executive Services. We are out of time. Congratulations. You're a failure. Oh. 
I failed. Did I? Yes. Did I? Yes. Did I? Yes. All right. This week's technology fail comes to us from LastPass again. Man, this, this company, good. this company is going to go out of business. They are, just cannot figure stuff out. What happened? All right. LastPass is a mobile and computer-based password manager system. Now, I want to explain this for any of our yeah, listeners. This used to be, be your favorite. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the application that you download. This allows you to store your passwords in the application to retrieve after you log in with one master password. So they mm-hmm. have a Chrome plugin. You can do this on your mobile phone. But LastPass is a password management application that you download. Right. Now, LastPass users are furious after being locked out due to multi-factor authentication resets. Now, multi-factor authentication is when you kind of ask for your phone to say, type in a number here, or kind of like when you get uh, texts and say, please type in this number. Multi-factor authentication had some problems with the LastPass managers as users have been experiencing significant login issues starting early May after being prompted to reset their authentication app logins. Numerous users have been locked out of their accounts and unable to access the LastPass vault, which is essentially all of your passwords. So if you use this system and you have all of your passwords in there, probably not being able to access the vault would be very troublesome to you. Uh, Compounding the problem, affected users cannot seek assistance from support since reaching out to LastPass support requires you to log into their account, which you cannot do because you're locked out using an affinity loop of promoting your multi-factor authentication issue. Wow. So here's the issue. You can't log into the app. The only you can use the app to get technical support. So essentially you are locked out. Yep. There is nothing you can do. I once worked for a pager store. Yeah. And the guy's computer system went down and we lost half of our subscribers. Yep. Went out of business about two months later. Two months so later. Well, so I use on his last pass. I use last pass, but I don't use a multi factor. Does that mean I'm smarter? Yeah, I guess you are because I don't Lazy use works I, at this Actually, point. you know what? I use last pass too, and I do not use multi factor either. So, you know what? Lazy I think works. we're both, both. In, in a situation we don't have How to worry about. How is it about. that you guys are always talking about multi-factor authentication and you're not using? Well, because I don't trust. I don't about? trust a company to not screw me like this. I mean, this. Thank you. Is essentially, I'm the same way. Yeah. I only keep my work passwords in there. None of my personal yep. stuff's in LastPass. I guess okay. Well, so the force resync in the multi-factor authentication is now preventing many users from logging into LastPass. They won't recognize the system. Uh, essentially, you have to go to Twitter right now if you want to get support, and you have to tweet them, hashtag LastPass, if you're a user that has multi-factor authentication problems. What a mess, essentially. LastPass says that um, they hope to fix this soon and to continue to use Twitter as your solution to contact <laughs> them by hashtagging them if you're unable to log into your account. Yeah, tweet All right, LastPass this, uh, when Elon Musk is in So the you need to, if you are a user of LastPass, which I did last night, you need to export all of your passwords into an Excel file with a with an encryption item so that no one hacks them because LastPass is probably going to go out of business. I would suggest you move to a new password manager. My suggestion is using Dashlane as the alternative for that. They are a nice alternative. It's a free process is available. I would be getting my use stuff. Multi factor authentication. Uh, they do too. Yeah, yeah. Do you do. use the multi factor authentication? No, for, okay. no, no. I don't do use it. <laughs> well, no. We tell people to use it all the time. I just don't use Come it. On, make for up my your pass. mind. <laughs> I just don't use it for my past. You know what? My Nathan Nugget is going to talk to you about the best way to store your password. We're not going to get there. Yes, we will. This is Mike's mesmerizing moment. Presented by Story Coffee. Visit storycoffee.com. Mike, let's talk about the sense of security. How well do you feel protected with your current password management system? You know, after today's show, I don't. You don't? No. <laughs> well, what do you use? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you manage that? This is your mesmerizing moment. Tell us how, how you do that. How do you feel secure? I just do what I do. <laughs> okay, so what, do you have like a secret in, into your system? I, what you, have? Oh, you know, I use pen and paper. Okay. I keep I keep my passwords on pen and paper. Okay. Like old school stuff. Okay. And nobody's ever gonna hack that. That is correct. That, that may be a part of but the Nathan Nugget. It that's, doesn't that's really it thing. doesn't really matter because you know everybody gets hacked nowadays, so they probably have my pen and paper. Pen and paper my well, when I type it in the keyboard. Yeah. I'm sure they, they have some way of 
scraping that off the internet somewhere somehow so hopefully you haven't downloaded any video games lately that were uh, no were i don't non- download video games okay uh, you know that helps you a bit i just don't like it you just don't no, like sir it. i don't like it all right so you, you do your does your do you com- <laughs> do your, do your? Does, does your company have a special uh password protection software that they expect you to use oh yeah we have a we have a vpn okay i have a vpn so i use a vpn okay uh, and we have a password protected system on there. So okay. yeah, it's that's good. Is it, yeah. So you super easy. See, see. Barely an inconvenience. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's move now to our Nathan Nugget. This is your nugget of the week. All right. So Mikey kind of stole some of my information. Let did me I tell you your thunder. Yeah, you did a little bit, but that's okay. I appreciate that. Well, you were you were talking about not using multi factor authentication for this. So well, let me yeah, just we're, tell we're you always the talking about best it. way. Uh, do your password management. It is going to sound so old school. You know what it is? It's a notebook that you write down your login, username, and your information. Because let me just tell you. Yeah, it's funny how all that stuff is comes really back important to Norton now. Now, yeah. if you're at a business association and, you, and you're working in a company, you don't want to have a notebook inside your, your computer that just has all this information because someone can come in and steal your notebook. But if you're at home, let me just tell you, home crimes, when people come on in and steal stuff in home crimes, they steal computers, it's steal televisions they do not steal a notebook that has handwritten information in there if if you have information you have a couple pages of doodle information maybe your scratch pad to to draw something type of deal mesmerizing moment because that's that's more there's more psychology behind that than well you how you back it up is real simple unless you have a fire you're, you're you're taken care of you make a copy of that put it in your safe in your house and you're good taken care of i know my uh specific wife is Password secure because she writes everything down on a green yeah, notebook. Yeah, there you go. So you can come in our house and steal the green notebook, and then you're good to go. I gotta tell. There you go. There you go. Tell everybody <laughs> where it is. Select to find where that green it? notebook. All right. All right. We're gonna move to our pick of the day here. Mark, what, what are we tasting again? Well, before that, when we go to your party, I'm gonna be looking for that green notebook. Okay, the Can green I, notebook yeah. is hidden. But what we're, <laughs> what we're tasting today is Willet Pot Still Reserve Bourbon. Okay. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Absolutely. Fantastic. This is the best. You know what, Mike? We're almost out of time here. We want to thank our We're listeners really for joining the program. Uh, <laughs> listeners, we want to hear from you. We have to head out to our 4th of July party, so you be safe. Keep your fingers. We're going to see you guys next week. A hat. Remember, a hat. the science of tomorrow starts with the technology of today. Bye-bye. Woo-hoo. Thanks for joining us on Tech Time Radio. We hope that you had a chance to have that hmm moment today in technology. The fun doesn't stop there. We recommend that you go to techtimeradio.com and join our fan list for the most important aspect of staying connected and winning some really great monthly prizes. We also have a few other ways to stay connected, including subscribing to our podcast on any podcast service from Apple to Google and everything in between. We're also on YouTube. So check us out on youtube.com slash techtimeradio, all one word. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did making it for you. From all of us at Tech Time Radio, remember, mum's the word. Have a safe and fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic week. Fantastic.